In our last episode, we talked about creating false narratives. We come up with stories, narratives, things that we see, and we press those things on other people, even though they aren't true. We're gaslighting people. We're making them believe things that we want them to believe, again, though they're not true. That video went off in another direction than what Daniel and I anticipated, and so we decided that we would do a follow-up from the last video. So, Daniel, you had some thoughts this is Daniel Berger, Rick Thomas, Life Over Coffee. Jump in, give can, me those can thoughts. Can I be Rick today? And you... <laughs> uh, We're yeah. creating false narratives. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly, so, yes. exactly. Uh, but, but to that point, whoever controls the narrative is, is essentially able to control and decide who is in delusional, deceived, etc. You know, so we're talking about a husband making up stuff and making the wife believe it. We're talking about an abusive wife who creates a false narrative and right. presses it. We're talking about children doing it, parents doing it, the children. And, and this is why in every relationship, and again, if we can go back to even our, our, our climate in the, in the United States, who controls what is perceived to be truth, and, and I'll probably right. say it, who controls truth. They're not really controlling truth, they're controlling what, what we should believe to be true. What they want us to believe. Right, that they are essentially directing where society or a family or a relationship, a friendship, et cetera, et cetera, uh, even a church should go, the direction they should go. And so that, that is the field of epistemology. What, what is true, how do we know it's true, and who has the authority to determine uh, uh, that, that reality? And as you look, and I don't mean to go back, there's so many parallels really between Nazi Germany and not, not just what's happening. Our, our, as I've said before in previous videos, our mental health system is right out of Nazi Germany. But you look at the parallels, the, the, the Nazis, even before the Holocaust began, actually uh, attacked what is true. They had book burnings. They, had, they collected books and burned them in order to that truth would not be disseminated, including Bibles as an example. And so we're, we're seeing that, and again, I'm not trying to equate what we're going through right now that we're in, it's possible. But the point is that whoever controls what is true, so this, these false checker ideas, it's for, for history in the United States, for, throughout, it's been you and I get to decide what is true. Now we're being told if you enter into a, this particular platform, and it's on multiple platforms, it's even in the news, we're going to tell you what is true, even if it's not. So news isn't reporting anymore. They're creating narratives. Right. And so uh, our, our, the real issue, not just of this past election that we've gone through, but also what we're going through in every relationship. And again, I want to bring this to, uh, if, if you're counseling me, you and I have to sit down and come to an agreement, right? So Amos 3.3 3 says, we're, we're, if two are to walk together, they must agree. Well, fundamentally then, any form of counseling, whether it's secular or biblical, there has to be an epistemology agreed upon. And so when I enter someone who's saying, I, I, I am trained in psychoanalysis, or I'm trained in the Kreplinian model, a psychiatrist who says, it's all biology, I'm saying to them, I've accepted your epistemology. I'm putting myself under your authority because I say you have truth. Right. And that's, that's incredibly important um, because in, in, when we talk about a marriage, uh, it's not that the husband has truth and it's not that the wife has truth. It's not in parenting. It's not that the parent has truth and the child has truth. It's that the Word of God is true, right? So if, if our epistemology is truly based on, on who God is, and let's take this into the church, right? A pastor's authority really is the Word of God. It's not him. Right. And so when, when that dynamic is, is correct, it's transformational in relationships, every relationship. But unfortunately, a lot of people, it's our natural bent to say, okay, I say that the Bible's authority, but I'm gonna control narratives, I'm gonna control situations, and even you know what we're seeing again in the political climate of manipulating uh, all facts that come our way to fit into that narrative. Right, so let me ask you this question. Uh, I, I totally agree with everything that you said. Uh, That's good because we couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we Christians, we have a source of truth, which is the Bible. And so everything flows out of that. Uh, other people, they have many different, whatever, whatever it is that they choose, whatever agenda that they're trying to push through. But I want to talk about sufficiency of Scripture. All right, so the pastor, his source of truth is here. The husband, his source of truth is here. The child, his source of truth is here. What about the source of truth? Because 
everybody enters into the text subjectively. And so we believe that Scripture is sufficient. It's the sole authority, and it's the, it's the launching pad for... It's, it's the source of epistemology. It is our epistemological <laughs> foundation, but we enter into the text subjectively. And so how do we come to agreement here when we are looking at it through a subjective lens. Well, that's, that's humility. Because two Christians can actually argue over what the Bible says and, and maybe even have some validity either way. Yeah, that, that, that first of all, requires humility, right? We, we're saying we haven't arrived, even, even if we know that we have truth. So I'll, I'll give you a case in point of this. Um, this past year, I, I was in a, a, a wonderful dialogue with someone who disagreed with me. So we had a... A Christian? A Christian. Sufficiency of Scripture? Yep. We had a fundamental difference in our, in our approach to a specific issue. Right. Yep, that's what I'm talking in, about. Instead of cutting each other off, which is a whole other topic, we, we began to dialogue. So what, what we said was we both truly believe that the Word of God is truth. And what began to happen, even though we haven't arrived at fully agreeing, what we both noticed was we're narrowing that difference. Yeah, I agree. And when um, the, 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 I think a lot of people know that there's a disagreement between John Piper and Wayne Grudem uh, on President Trump. Uh, Piper would not vote for him. Grudem, I think, would or at least be okay with it, but they have different views. Both of them believe in sufficient scripture. One of the things I read in Wayne's rebuttal to what John said was that Wayne sent it to John and said, here's my rebuttal. And Wayne said, John actually wrote back and said, here's a couple of areas where you could shore up your points against me. That's the humility piece that you're talking about. When the person who disagrees with you right. actually wants to help you to shore, well, to shore up your points, we're not combatants anymore. We're two people on the same team looking at it and trying to come to a so solution. And so if a husband and wife believe in the sufficiency of Scripture, which I hope they would, but they have two different perspectives on some secondary issue, we're not talking about the gospel here, then they should be supporting each other in trying to find truth together exactly. as opposed to uh, digging their foxhole and in, in, entrenching themselves to where it's more of a warfare rather than a collective pursuit for truth. Yeah, and where do we see this more than anywhere? In, in our systematic theologies, right? right? I mean, let's let's go to a touchy subject here. If if we have a different uh, opinion of our systematic theology, we essentially have two options. We can we can cut each other off, call names, throw rocks, which historically has happened. You know, even even killings of other people have occurred in 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 church history, and or we can say, are both uh, you know, both of us desire to know God. He is truth. So God is truth. So therefore, our relationship should be that we strive graciously. We can disagree. Well, let's talk right. through things. Right. And what will happen, undoubtedly, is one or the other person, that maybe both people need to, to repent. And by that, I mean change their mind, right? Uh, which is, and, and, and I'll say this too, we should be repenting. That's what Christians do. Right. It's not we repented and therefore we have truth and and we're we're on this pathway like Proverbs says Our to, life to obtain it. Repentance and ongoing repentance. It, it's ongoing repentance exactly. And and so if our minds aren't constantly changing, then we're not actually we, we we've got this wrong view that we've arrived, which means we've stopped pursuing what we should. Yeah, I remember. Uh, I remember things visually, and I was sitting at an intersection in Commerce, Georgia, uh, probably 35 years ago with a pastor friend of mine. We were talking about 1 Corinthians 13, when that which is perfect is come. And I'll never forget, sitting at that traffic light, he said, Rick, if you interpret it this way, you open the door to charismatic, uh, to the miraculous gifts. And I was a fundamentalist at that time, and, and so we had a very tight way of a, a, a lot of things, but I was working through stuff, and I hadn't landed on being a, I was working through being a cessationist or a continuationist. Yeah. 
But when he said that, like, so he came to the text with a predetermined decision. We can't open this door. Whatever you do, you can't open the door to being a continuationist. Therefore, because I have <laughs> this, that. you can't bring this interpretation right. to the text. And I had not worked through that yet. But even back then, he stated it backwards. I have my position. Therefore, this text cannot say that. And that's called eisegesis. And, there's, and I, again, I had not worked through it, but I thought, there's something about that that doesn't sound right. I don't want to be open to every view that comes down right. the pike, but yet I, I do want to work honestly with the text, and I don't want to be so determined on something, especially tertiary yeah. matters, that I, I, I determine my position and then I read the text accordingly. Well, and, and, and to your point, I, I think it's good to illustrate that not all of us are on the same path. In other words, a, a true believer should be one who's desiring to know Christ to his truth, right? He's the way, the truth, and the life. But some people who claim to be truly aren't believers. Others in the world are, are clearly not headed in the same direction. Our job is to evangelize. Uh, so what we're doing is then we're trying to win people, all people, into truth. If we have truth, we shouldn't be afraid to dialogue, but in a gracious way. Right. And, and what I found is when, when, when truth, and it's not my truth, it's I, when I've embraced a genuine truth, dialoguing or reading a book that someone disagrees, it actually furthers me in that truth, if right. that makes sense. The problem is, so let's take Facebook, a real issue right now. I personally am getting off of Facebook. And the reason is, is not because this cancer culture where I'm just done with you, I'm, I'm out of here. It's actually, they're not allowing truth to be dialogued. So th that's a whole different ball game. They're, they're essentially saying, we're gonna cut off anyone who disagrees with us. So if we're in a conversation, there's no way for me to even present and all that's going on is just this one way rhetoric. And, and even if no one else is listening, that's not actually helping. Right. It's pointless, essentially. So uh, there's a lot of people leaving the, the, the Facebook, Twitter platform because this is a, an epistemological issue. That's, that's really what's going on. The big takeaway is uh, we want to be humble. Uh, we want to hold the truth humbly. We want to be firm in what we believe, uh, but we don't want to attack people, a uh, husband or a wife or children, the family dynamic. Uh, I, I want to interrupt ahead. you because I think the takeaway what you're saying that, that just came to my mind when you said that is we don't want to use truth to control others. We want to use truth to point them to the truth. Yes, and, and uh, if, if we can't hold it humbly, uh, we have nothing to fear. We have nothing to hide. We have nothing to protect. The gospel frees us uh, to, to be very open and honest with what we believe. Uh, and so we don't want to force engineer what we believe over people. We want to communicate that in a counseling session. Counselors could do that. Uh, you just present the truth. We're talking in another video. You go to these conferences. You're speaking to psychiatrists and psychologists. You just present the truth and let the counselor show up and, and do that work. And we can be humble in our presentation and don't have to be aggravational. Thank you for watching the video. If you have... Uh, a suggested topic that you would like for Daniel and I to do, please just put it in the comment section. If we can serve you in any way, let us know that too. Thanks again for watching and God bless.